Uh, colleagues, welcome. Uh, thank you all for being so prompt in uh, joining the call today. I'm going to give it a couple of minutes before we begin, but um, I, we just wanted to welcome you all uh, and uh, really acknowledge uh, your participation today. Uh, I noticed that um, a number of you are joining from um, very um, challenging time zones in terms of today's meeting. I can see that we've got uh, colleagues like uh, the Honourable Mike Lake joining from Canada, where I think it's about 4am, which, so I'd have to say that's this is well beyond the call of duty. So we really appreciate that. Very, very generous um, with your time. And I, I, I don't want to um, miss other colleagues who are joining um, at difficult or challenging times from, from their time zones, but we do definitely appreciate that. So, so welcome and, and, and thank you. So colleagues, I think given that you have all been so prompt, um, let's, let's kick off. Um, my name is uh, Joseph Nana Riley, and I'm the Executive Director of the International Parliamentary Network for Education, of which many of you are, of course, uh, members, and we appreciate that very much. Um, I was not uh, going to be your chair today. Um, in fact, um, we had arranged for Menaz Aziz from Pakistan, a member of the National Assembly there, to uh, moderate today's session. But in a rather unfortunate, um, but nevertheless kind of a stark reminder of the challenges of COVID, uh, she actually messaged us late yesterday to indicate that she wouldn't be able to participate today uh, because she actually has contracted the virus and has been ordered rest. I think she's also not feeling very well. Um, we're very disappointed about that because um, uh, Manaz would have been a perfect chair for this session. Before entering Parliament in 2018, uh, she had been the director for more than 20 years of the Children's Global Network in Pakistan, uh, championing both children's rights and particularly uh, the importance of quality education. Uh, and so we were looking forward to, to her moderation and sharing some of those insights and experiences. So I have stepped in at the last minute, um, and I know that all of you would want to, um, to share uh, your best wishes for a speedy recovery with Manaz and I know that she wants to participate in things moving forward so we look forward to welcoming her back to an ITNED event uh, very soon. Um, so um, uh, with your permission I will, will chair the session at, late, at short notice and um, I would also just uh, want to acknowledge that I think um, our global co-chair uh, Harriet Baldwin is, is, is joining us as well. Um, from the UK Parliament and uh, along with a number of other parliamentary colleagues who I can see from Germany, uh, from, from, from Bangladesh uh, and, and from elsewhere. And we'll get a chance to hear from you um, shortly. So um, uh, colleagues, just a couple of housekeeping uh, issues. Uh, I believe that um, my colleagues at the Internet Secretariat are, are kind of managing the Zoom and have probably tried to put you all on mute. Uh, that's not because we don't want to hear from you. It's just to reduce the background noise until we open the, um, the session to questions and discussion. Um, I would invite you all actually, if you haven't already, to introduce yourselves on the chat, just to indicate where you're from. I know we've got parliamentary colleagues and some friends from civil society joining us today. So if you wanted to say who you are and uh, give people on the call an indication of where we have colleagues joining from, I think that would be really helpful. We are, of course, recording today's session uh, so that it will be available for those who couldn't join us. Um, so just be mindful of that. Uh, and if anything uh, happens during the call today, which uh, prompts you to uh, share an insight experience on Twitter, please do. Um, I think you'll all know our hashtag, um, and um, which is political leadership for education. Um, so uh, we want the, the messages from today and the insights and experiences that are shared to be, um, to be amplified, uh, including on social media. So feel free to do that. Um, I would say just also that today's session uh, is the first in a series of four briefings for MPs on this issue of COVID-19. Uh, in our survey of members of IPNED, uh, you rated uh, navigating and responding to COVID as your top priority. So this is an attempt to provide you with information and to allow you to share insights and experiences with your peers. Uh, today's session is, of course, on COVID-19 children and schools, with a real focus on the big picture, including, um, very critically, uh, the latest scientific evidence from the World Health Organization about transmission and risk and the minimization of that in educational settings. And we're very much looking forward to hearing from Dr. Valentina Baltag on that shortly.
Um, the next three sessions, which will occur over the next three weeks, which we now have uh, dates and speakers, will focus on learning, uh, equity and financing, which are three IPNED priorities. And they are, of, or are all, of course, deeply affected by uh, the COVID pandemic and have their own um, issues uh, and implications, which we will dive into um, in detail over the coming weeks. Um, so I think without further ado, we're going to, to begin our, our session. Um, there is a, in addition to uh, getting Maniz Aziz's apology, um, we also have a slight uh, change to the timing on this session. We've just been in touch with Dr. Nabarro's office, uh, who appears to um, have a clash, and he's going to join us as soon as he's off his other call. Um, so we would have started with Dr. Nabarro for that global picture, but we are going to now begin uh, with a brief uh, video message from the Assistant Director General of UNESCO, Stefania Giannini. Stefania is, of course, responsible in the UN system for education, and UNESCO has been playing an important role in monitoring school closures and supporting member states in uh, reopening schools and monitoring the impact uh, of the epidemic on uh, education. So uh, without further ado, I would ask uh, Zoe to share the uh, video uh, message from the Assistant Director General of UNESCO. Thank you for this opportunity. I warmly commend you for the establishment of this international parliamentary network for education. I would argue that parliamentarians hold the keys uh, to protect in our education systems as they recover from the most severe disruption in recent history. At the peak of the pandemic, school and universities closures affected 1.6 billion students in 190 countries. An unprecedented situation, I should say. Governments should be commended for the speed and agility with uh, which they reacted to the crisis. Our recent survey of 150 countries finds that almost all of them introduced remote learning using online platforms, TV and radio channels and take-home packages. However, inequalities have been amplified. The UN Secretary General has warned of a generational catastrophe this summer without political will, without resources and without remedial action. In poorer countries, students have lost out on nearly four months of schooling, compared with six weeks in high-income ones. And today, uh, two, uh, two, 24 uh, million students from pre-primary pre and uh, uh, to tertiary and university level are at risk of dropout because of the crisis. Schools remain closed in a handful of countries, around 20 today, while many are functioning on hybrid models. Last uh, October 22nd, UNESCO convened a, an important meeting, a global education meeting with the governments of Ghana, the United Kingdom and Norway to set the course of the year ahead. At the state, ministers from over 70 countries committed to at least maintain or hopefully increase education budgets, including aid to education in the face of the recession. Education budgets must be protected from uh, the recession on the same count as the health, at the time when poverty is likely to increase. Education and health are two pillars uh, of public policy to rebuild bad better. Education is also a driver for recovery and uh, the bedrock for more inclusive, equal and sustainable societies. This is why it is so important to feature education in stimulus packages. Unfortunately, according to our preliminary research, this is not the case. Education is receiving less than 1% of these packages, a near invisible share, so to say. In addition to financing, governments identified four priorities to reset education in the coming months. First, to reopen schools safely, because longer they stay closed, the higher the risk of students uh, whether it's academic loss, social-emotional impact, or simply lack of access to, to nutrition. 
It's telling that schools are being kept open in second and third lockdown. It testifies to education's essential role in society. Second, the recovery means supporting all teachers as frontline workers, ensuring their safety, multiplying their training opportunities, especially in the realm of digital competencies. Third, it's about investing in skills development and finally narrowing the digital divide that has barred so many children from learning during this period and putting equity at the center of this, filling the gap of digital divide and connectivity. While this is a deep crisis, it's also an opportunity, as all crises definitely, for transformation, for innovation, for shift of paradigm, and to make our education systems more inclusive, more relevant, and more resilient. Over the past nine months, we have witnessed new and wider models of cooperation. UNESCO's Global Education Coalition, established from the beginning of the crisis March this year, now counts uh, 160 partners mm. matching expertise mm. needs to ensure learning continuity. We are at a turning point and must size the momentum. This is the time advocate for education that gives every learner the skills to grow and contribute productively to a world that is bound by interdependence. Every student has the capacity to become a responsible and critical citizen, caring towards others and towards the planet with an aspiration to contribute positively to society and the world around him or her, provided by receiving education that connects the cognitive, socio-emotional and ethical dimension of learning. We need the parliamentarians on board to make education a political and social priority. Let me say also, as a former parliamentarian in the Senate of my country, I look forward to continue collaboration with this network to advance the right to quality education everywhere. I thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, Stefania. Uh, as she said, and I omitted from her introduction, uh, Stefania was a senator uh, in Italy and is a former minister for uh, universities, uh, education and research. So brings a lot of experience to this discussion. And we're delighted to be working with UNESCO on a number of fronts. Uh, Stefania also uh, convened a, uh, a extraordinary meeting uh, of the global education community as uh, part of the efforts of UNESCO to bring everyone together, which I think some of you would have been aware of, and that happened a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago now. Uh, so colleagues, the, the focus of these uh, discussions is very much on um, trying to uh, hear from all of you. So we are going to quickly move to our next presentation, and that is from uh, Dr. Valentina Baltag. Uh, Dr. Baltag has had a distinguished career at the World Health Organization, where she is uh, now a, a senior member of the Department for uh, uh, Children's Adolescent Health, and she is now the global uh, lead at the World Health Organization for the reopening of schools. And what we're going to do is hear from her on the latest evidence uh, of transmission and impact of the disease on children, um, and the guidance that the World Health Organization is providing governments on uh, keeping schools uh, uh, open in a COVID safe as possible way. Valentina, the floor is now yours. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Uh, and it was an upgrade when you said that I am the lead person uh, for reopening schools in WHO. There is actually a large team that works across departments as our department, uh, which is maternal, child, newborn, adolescent health and aging and uh, um, uh, incident management team and colleagues that work on the epidemiology of COVID-19. So we work together. And at, what I will present today is uh, the synthesis of evidence, what we know to date about the COVID-19 transmission in children and schools. Uh, so uh, um, if you can put the slides, please, then uh, obviously uh, this uh, uh, should, uh, it, it, uh, it is useful also to have a global overview, which uh, uh, due to uh, logistics will follow after my presentation. Uh, but uh, what we know today about the role of children in transmission of COVID-19, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, the first question uh, is what we know about children and COVID-19. 
because uh, here we will uh, discuss two different questions related but different what you know about children and COVID-19 and you know about schools and COVID-19. So first children and COVID-19. We know that COVID-19 is reported much less frequently in children than adults. Children and adolescents represent about 8% of reported cases, whereas they constitute 29% uh, of the global population. What we also know that when they do get COVID, uh, much offer, uh, often than not, it's much milder disease than in adults and often asymptomatic. At the same time, we know that children with underlying conditions are at greater risk of serious illness. Rarely, a few may develop severe disease like multisystem inflammatory syndrome, and deaths have also been reported. But for those very reasons that children have milder disease and they are often asymptomatic, the role of children in transmission is not yet fully understood. And this has become mo most of, because most of the studies are looking at symptomatic patients and then are tracing what is happening to them, where they get infected and so on. So they would miss many children who have mild uh, disease and are asymptomatic. So the summary uh, from those studies that have this bias that I explained is that children of all ages can be infected and spread the virus to others. However, when you look at the susceptibility and infectivity, we know that those increase with age. So susceptibility is a, a term that means how easily children get the infection. Data is still limited, but current information from most studies suggest that SARS-CoV-2 virus susceptibility rises with age and young children are less susceptible to the virus than older children. Infectivity, which is a term of uh, how uh, easy the children pass the infection to others, we know again that this rises with age and adolescents transmit virus as often as adults and more readily than young children. However, both uh, information on susceptibility and infectivity uh, continues to evolve and may change as better studies with less biases are being designed and conducted. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, now about schools. This is one of the most concerning questions, uh, which is the extent to which COVID-19 spreads in schools. We know that since early 2020, there were few outbreaks reported in schools, but studies were limited during school closures and other stay-at-home measures, and we are learning more as schools reopen. Uh, and in most infections of COVID-19 cases reported in children, infection was acquired at home. We know also that more outbreaks were reported in secondary high school than in primary or elementary school, and this is in line with uh, what I explained about transmission in children, because children under the age of 10 years old are less susceptible and less infectious than older ones. Uh, when it was investigated uh, how the transmission has happened in those schools outbreaks, we saw that transmission staff to staff was most common, staff to students was less common, and student to student was even less common. It is important then to look also that uh, is school closure an effective measure of uh, reducing community transmission? And some mo modeling studies suggested that this measure uh, is less, uh, um, reduces less the community transmission than other social distancing interventions. Next slide, please. Uh, it is very important also to understand that schools uh, is a continuation of the community, is part of the community and does not operate in a perfect isolation. Therefore, the risk of outbreak rises when community transmission is high. Evidence from schools and camps show us that there is a strong link between number of outbreaks and local tra transmission. And schools being open did not lead to rise in community spread where infection was low. Preventive measures also prompt case detection and contact tracing averted large outbreaks. The, uh, we all know about uh, large outbreaks that have been reported in media and did occur, but when those were investigated, in both instances, prevention measures were weak. 
And when the white, there is a widespread community transmission uh, or the number of cases is rising, preventive and protective measures in school are even more important. Next slide, please. Uh, but COVID-19 and related consideration is the, not the only consideration when uh, policy decisions are being made about uh, opening, reopening, or continuation of in-person teaching. We know that school closures can affect children in many ways, and uh, Stefania highlighted the impact on education from purely health and healthcare point of view. We know that closures disrupt school-based services such as immunization, school meals, mental health and psychosocial support, and can cause anxiety due to the loss of peer interaction and disrupted routines. Uh, and let's not forget that for many vulnerable children, school-based and school-linked services is the only accessible source of care. So when schools are closed, they lose this uh, uh, only source of care. Being out of school increases the risk of teenage pregnancy, sexual exploitation, child marriage, violence, and other threats. And we know that harms are greater for vulnerable children, such as migrants, refugees, minorities, children living with disabilities. Next slide, please. So what are the implications for school public health policies? We know that COVID-19 appears to have less effect on children's health than for adults. In contrast, school closures can adversely affect children's health, education, and development. So children in schools are unlikely, as far as you know today, to be the main drivers of COVID-19 transmission. When community transmission is low and when appropriate mitigation measures are applied. And closures of schools, therefore, should be considered only if there is no other alternatives. More caution, however, is necessary regarding secondary high schools and older students compared to primary elementary school. We have not to forget that adult personnel, teaching personnel and school staff uh, may be at risk of acquiring and transmitting the infection. So control measures to protect staff uh, must be reinforced and school, po school policy should support personnel to enable isolation and quarantine when necessary. Again, community transmission is reflected in the school setting, and public health measures in the community are essential to protect schools from amplifying transmission. Next slide, please. And here are the implications of various situations of uh, transmission at country level for uh, educational institutions. This is a very um, it's a recent guidance or rather a very recent update of the guidance that is called guidance on adjusting public health and social measures in the context of COVID-19. And the, this guidance looks at five situational levels. A situational level is a combination of the level of transmission with country readiness to respond. So five levels are identified from situational level zero uh, non-known transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and the health system and public health authorities are ready to respond all the way to situational level four, where you have a widespread community transition with limited or no additional capacity for the country to respond, and then three levels in between. So what we recommend uh, and the implications for educational institutions is that even for level four, which is the most difficult and challenging level, the closure of educational facilities should only be considered when there are no other alternatives. And all of the continuity of learning while limiting in-person contacts should be considered. Next slide, please. Uh, a few I will highlight in the next slide a few guidance without going in depth, but you, uh, I believe you have those slides as reference and all the links are provided. So the first one uh, is uh, considerations for school related public health measures in the context of COVID-19. And this guidance uh, provide guidance on the pillars uh, of uh, uh, what has to be done. And this is around hygiene and daily practices at school, physical distancing measures, uh, inside the classroom and outside the classroom, use of masks in schools based on the uh, WHO and UNICEF uh, advice on children, which reiterates uh, a differential approach based on 
focused on the age of the children, ventilation, caring for students and staff who feel unwell. And various strategies are being described uh, how to achieve, for example, physical distancing, so staggering, bubbling, environmental design measure, blended learning, setting attendance and entry rules, reorganization of school transportation, and managing students' behaviors. Next slide, please. Uh, we have published a case investigation and contact tracing at school, uh, which explains what to do if student or staff tests positive for COVID-19. Uh, and this should be in line with uh, the national policies of how to notify official, uh, officials about a case. In this case, staff and family immediately while maintaining confidentiality and block with health uh, officials to assess spread in school uh, and then other considerations. Next slide, please. Uh, because the indirect measures of school closures are so important and the harms are so big, additional measures for schools, uh, well, additional, but it's really important measures in addition to infection prevention and control is to ensure that school-based health services, immunization meals and support services are being maintained uh, while ensuring the equity and quality of education through equitable access to remote learning and monitoring of school operations. Next slide, please. So here is the list of resources that I mentioned uh, in my presentation. Um, they are available on, uh, on the website, uh, resources from WHO, but also for our colleagues from other UN agencies. Uh, there are other resources in the next slide, videos uh, that can be used for health promotion messages. And next slide, please. Uh, and um, uh, I will stop here and I will be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Beltag, for that presentation. Um, that was fantastic, very thorough, um, uh, and I learned a lot. I felt like I had a little, little mini course um, in epidemiology and public health, so that was fantastic, and I know some of the, the terms a little better now. Um, colleagues, we are expecting Dr. Nabarro, the uh, Director General of the World Health Organization's Special Envoy on COVID-19 to join us. He's on another call, um, but uh, so that we can begin the discussion and then bring him in when he arrives. I'm going to open the meeting now to our uh, questions uh, and the sharings of experiences and insights from our parliamentary members. If questions, um, if you do have a question, it'd be great if you could indicate in the chat that you, um, that you want to, but also you can bring yourself off mute, I believe, um, and, and just intervene. So um, let's do that and open the conversation up, including specifically uh, any questions in follow-up to Dr. Baltag's presentation. Could I also, maybe, maybe um, Dr. Baltag, I will, will kick off. Um, we, we have heard in the press some of the, from some of the, uh, the, 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 the case studies that you mentioned, I think you talked about the Israel uh, situation and you mentioned that actually some of the preventative measures were weak in those contexts. Could you say a little bit more about that? Because I think they're the kind of examples that often people quote um, in respect of uh, the high transmission in school settings and understanding those a little bit better would be helpful. Uh, yes, thank you. I think details matters. And um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, this is why it is important to uh, look at those reported cases. And sometimes they make, uh, you know, have big visibility in media uh, and might uh, convey inadvertently uh, some wrong messages. So uh, we know that in Israel, a large COVID-19 outbreak has happened in a high school with insufficient health measures. Uh, well, on, uh, on March, Israel closed all schools, then fully reopened on uh, about mid-May, uh, and uh, measures that were put in place included daily health report, hygiene, face masks, social distancing, minimal interaction between classes. But uh, somewhere at the end of May, there was an extreme heat wave, and the Ministry of Health exempted pupils from wearing masks. Windows were closed, and air conditioning functioned continuously. 10 days later, a major COVID-19 outbreak 
uh, occurred in a high school where over a thousand students and uh, 150 plus staff were tested uh, and um, uh, a, a number of cases were confirmed. Um, so this uh, exemption from wearing mask, uh, the air conditioning uh, was functioning, you know, continuously. Uh, and classes also were reported crowded. It was about one student per one uh, square meter. Uh, so it was concluded that public health measures were not adequate and contributed to the outbreak. We can contrast this, um, uh, for, for example, because uh, England has a system of monitoring what is happening in school and the level of transmissions since the school reopening. And the conclusion from a preliminary analysis of data was that where infection prevention and control measures were in place, there were no outbreaks. So there is a direct link of what happens in school with two factors. One, the levels of the community transmission, because as we said, schools is the continuation of the community. What happens in the community will happen uh, later or sooner in schools if uh, infection and prevention control measures are, are not in place. So the levels of the community transmission and the level of adherence and fidelity to infection and recommended infection prevention and control measures is what makes a difference. Fantastic. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I, um, colleagues, I've just been advised that uh, Dr. Navarro will be joining any minute, so we'll turn to him. But just prior to that, I would really be interested in hearing from any of our um, parliamentary participants from around the world. And we have many on the call from Austria, Bangladesh, Senegal, uh, the UK, Italy, Nepal, South Africa. Um, you know, from their own sense of things, um, what whether or not the advice and the guidance that uh, Dr. Balkag has shared, how, how you think that's being operated uh, and operationalized in your country. And I think, um, you know, getting that sense of your experiences would be really interesting on this call, including, of course, as parliamentarians, whether you feel as though you've had the right information and support to, um, to understand the epidemic and its impact on education in your settings. I think uh, Honourable Mike Lake from Canada has got his hand raised, so we'll we'll hear from you, Mike, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. It's uh, so it's a uh, I guess just after it's about four thirty in the morning here now in Edmonton, so it's getting nice and late. Uh, I've got uh, my two two coffees here, uh, my starting coffee and then my secondary uh, one, which I'm on already. Um, but it is great to be here. Um, just a little bit of background. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a federal member of parliament uh, interested in international uh, development issues. So I don't, uh, in Canada, uh, education is more of a provincial issue, but I'm really come to my interest in education more from international context. My question though will be, you piqued my interest, Dr. Baltag, on the, talking about the air conditioning in the school. And I think here in Canada, we've, you know, in our schools, it's starting to get cold. And so, you know, schools are closed down and the heating systems will be ramped up. And, uh, you know, I don't come from a medical background, but it was interesting to hear what you said. We've got a fairly significant transmission rate uh, in Alberta, the province where I am right now, and uh, wondering if there's anything schools can do as we get colder and their heating systems ramp up. First of all, does that actually have an impact uh, air flowing more through the school, but in a closed system, if you have uh, cases? And secondary, what, uh, what can schools do to mitigate that? Terrific, thank you. Dr. Beltag? Uh, thank you very much for the question. And, um, uh, regarding to ventilation, uh, yes, uh, ventilation of indoor spaces, the recommendation is to increase the airflow and dilute any contaminants. Uh, open windows and doors for natural ventilation, which might be not be possible uh, during the winter time because of the low te temperature. Uh, what is the, well, WHO has, first of all, um, some guidance, specific guidance and Q&As on ventilation and air conditioning in the context of COVID-19. You can access this on WHO website. There is also a guidance which is called Operational Considerations for COVID-19 Management in the Accommodation Sector, uh, which also has some advice. But uh, when it is, uh, uh, why it is important when uh, the ventilation and air conditioning systems are in place, that filters are regularly cleaned, maintained, inspected, and operating properly. Um, and set central air filtration to the highest level possible 
uh, this is what is recommended and disable controls that reduce air supply automatically um, and uh, where possible consider running outside airflow for two hours before or after the building is occupied. So basically, if there is not possible to open uh, the windows and doors for natural ventilation and ensure as much as possible outdoor air, then uh, it should be a very rigorous um, control for the filters and the maintenance of the filters and also uh, set the filtration at the highest level possible. Over. Terrific. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Beltag. Uh, and, and thank you to Mr. Lake for that, for that question. Um, colleagues, as I said, um, Dr. Nabarro is now with us. We're delighted that he's been able to join. Um, I think he will be very familiar to many of you. Uh, he certainly is to me um, because I often, um, my, my ears prick up when I hear him on the radio or see something that he's written because I know it will have a lot of important information and great insights. He is, of course, the World Health Organization Director General's Special Envoy on COVID-19. He's um, had many uh, roles at the World Health Organization over many years. Um, and amongst other things, he um, uh, has advised the UN Secretary General on the SDGs. Uh, and I'd just like to turn the floor to him. Um, Dr. Nabarro has agreed to provide us with uh, a bit of a general overview of where the epidemic is and its implications for the achievement of the SDGs, including, of course, education. Dr. Nabarro, thank you. Joseph, thank you very much indeed. The first thing I want to do is to say to Mike Lake uh, that uh, he is an absolute hero for being up at 4.30 in the morning. I've been, when I was based in New York, I used to sometimes have to do nine o'clock meetings in Geneva from New York. And uh, first of all, you feel pretty rotten when you get up uh, at, 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 say, quarter to four. And secondly, it, it hits you later in the day. So, Mike, uh, just uh, to you and to anybody else who's operating in this way at, at weird hours, thank you. Secondly, uh, I'm really apologetic that we had a mix-up. I've just been talking to uh, 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 leaders in um, Congo Brazzaville, actually, about the relationship between COVID, food, education and nutrition and uh, I really felt I uh, having had the mix uh, I had to actually complete that because they'd assembled to talk to me uh, but thank you for that and thirdly to Valentina it's lovely to be on this with you and I I'm I'm really impressed with what you and colleagues have been doing to try to work through the challenges of COVID in schools uh, it's been a pretty remarkable collaboration between the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and the International Academy uh, 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 of Pediatrics. Uh, about five high-level meetings during the summer months in the Northern Hemisphere, because it's just not easy. Uh, we, we spent a long time trying to work out what is the role of the school as an institution in uh, leading to COVID transmission? And secondly, what are the risks for the children themselves, for the teachers and for the parents, and then trying to dissect out the various things? I'm sure that you've had a discussion on that with Dr. Baltag. So uh, what the way I would like to do it is as follows, uh, having been late, I'm gonna be five minutes and then I'm gonna stop. And what I would love, Joseph, is if people could just chuck questions at me, I'll bundle them and I'll answer, because with this particular community of leaders on the children and education and SDG4, uh, I, I think that the more I am able to connect with you, and if I can't uh, really answer the issues that you raise, then I'll take them away and I'll work on them with my colleague, Catherine, who's on the call, and I'll come back to you. And we have, we've done quite a lot of work ourselves. We put together a paper on understanding COVID-19 in school settings, which we hope will be helpful. But um, I don't want to just offer pieces of paper. I want to be responsive. Just where is this pandemic going, you might ask? And I'm going to say the following. This is still, in my view, in its early stages. We cannot say we're towards the end of the pandemic. There's just no way we can. And the reason is as follows. 
the virus is not changing. It seems to be remarkably stable. Uh, and though we get reports of mutations, which is normal with any virus, the, the really important fact is that the general potency of the virus as a cause of disease seems to be sticking consistent in all different parts of the world over time. That's what we expect of coronavirus. They are generally, as a, as a family of viruses, stable, much more stable, for example, than influenza viruses. Uh, yes, we've got wonderful news on vaccines. Actually, for me, quite surprising because it's never been easy to develop vaccines against coronaviruses. But yeah, we've got three that are showing good results in their phase three trials. One from Moderna, uh, one from Pfizer, and one from Russia, the Sputnik vaccine. But we have other candidates coming through. And, and it's said that there are around 10 or 11 in their phase three trials, which is the final trial before you can then take a vaccine to a regulatory authority to get special emergency use authorization. But we're not going to have enough vaccine to be able to be sure that all the people who need it will be vaccinated before, in my view, either the end of 2021 or the beginning of 2022. Yes, there will be some countries that are able to get a million or two or three doses. Uh, yes, there will be some countries that are able to really ramp up the capacity to immunize large numbers of people quickly. But every time I read leaders or, or, or supporters of leaders saying, we will be starting a vaccination campaign next month, we will be able to get lots of people vaccinated and the pandemic will be under control by uh, March or April next year, I'm saying, wow, that's not where my head is at. My head is saying we've still got, uh, I hope, uh, a, a month or so for really looking hard at the data to check absolutely that the vaccines are super safe as well as being effective. Uh, and then secondly, you know, the process of ramping up an immunization program of a vaccine that needs to be kept pretty cold, uh, the Pfizer one needs the moment to be kept at minus 60 centigrade. That is a big job. So I'm saying to everybody, in my judgment, it will not be possible for all the people who need to access this vaccine in our world to get it until really into 2022. And it's going to be tough, the, the, the interim period. On the one hand, you've got these brilliant reports of fantastic cooperation to develop vaccines, and people really fed up with the restrictions that are being put on them. And on the other hand, it just is a finite length of time. And Catherine and others who do, who do public health know that this is not an easy job. So we're going to have to live with this virus as a constant threat in our societies, really until the vaccination is widespread. And that's some time to come. So what does that mean? Well, I think the way in which leaders communicate with people about what's going on needs to be really thought through quite carefully. And you as education leaders, I think will understand what I'm getting at. You know, we're actually asking billions of people in our world to make constant changes to their behavior. We're saying, maintain physical distance. We're saying, wear face protection all the time when you're indoors. And if you're outdoors, at least when you're in close contact with people in markets and so on. We're saying, practice really good hygiene, hand hygiene, cough hygiene, and surface cleaning. We're saying, stay away, out of sight, out of the way if you're feeling sick and stay isolated for the full length of time. Do not, do not fiddle around and come out and uh, sort of pretend that you're isolating and not do so. And we're saying, look after people who've got diabetes, got high blood pressure and got other conditions. Look after older people because we've had 
tremendous mortality in residential care settings, tremendous mortality among old people. And remember, this is now becoming a disease of the poor and disadvantaged, people who live in very, very dense housing and people who are in employment, which is often really tricky employment like food processing factories or uh, other places where they don't get well paid because these are the people who are suffering. And we're, we're saying, do those things and do them everywhere and don't stop. And I know there are many political leaders who are saying, well, this is all rubbish, but we're having to say back to them, well, okay, but this virus doesn't vote. This virus doesn't have affiliations. This virus doesn't suddenly calm down because a big leader is saying, I'm not frightened of you. This virus is remarkably consistent, ferocious and beastly. It's storming back into Europe at the present time. The only way European nations are being able to deal with it is by going back into lockdown, which is a bit of an admission of defeat. And yet in East Asia, we have examples of countries who are able to sustain their economies and sustain pretty large parts of social life with the virus still being a constant threat. The situation facing Taiwan and China situation facing South Korea and Japan, situation facing New Zealand and Australia is not different in any way from the situation facing Western Europe, Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, or the situation facing Canada, the United States or Latin America. We're basically dealing with the same problem, the same virus. But what's the difference between East Asia and the rest of the world? Answer, they hold the virus back. And the moment it starts to appear, they deal with it promptly, not with a nationwide lockdown, with localized movement restrictions, but with very good public health, very good work with their, their people through a social contract and brilliant leadership. Just look at Jacinta Arden. That is really good leadership. So we've got a little problem in some parts of Europe. Let me just take... Europe as my example. I'm here in Switzerland. The epicenter of the virus in Europe is in the part of Switzerland where I am working. And what's the problem? Answer, European nations have tried to somehow do a deal with the virus and say, well, let's do some kind of partial response, progressive response, but at the same time, let's try to do everything possible to keep our economies open. But by trying to do the two things simultaneously, they've got themselves hugely tangled up because it doesn't work like that. You have to get this virus under control and then your economy is okay. But if you make any kind of mistake on that and you try to say, well, we'll keep bits of the economy going uh, and all that, then the virus will win. And in the US, of course, the situation is really, really serious. So in schools, here is my goal. My goal is that all children should continue to be able to go to school despite the fact the virus is around. Second part of the goal is that therefore, we need to have really good and well understood protocols for what to do in school but recognize that each individual school will need to do some modification of those protocols because a number of the things that we're asking schools to do are just not possible in certain building structures, not possible in certain educational environments. And number three, we need to be doing everything possible to support the children, to support the teachers and to support the parents so that the school does not become a center for transmission in the community. Uh, that's my basic remark. It's not probably going to add to your discussion, but I just thought I would say these things and now stop. And in case, Joseph, there are ways in which we can pick up on questions, that would be great. I don't want children to stop being educated. I am one of these people who believes, because of my work on nutrition and my work on child health, that maintaining a steady support for the child through a really good and open educational process is the key to the future. And so uh, together with colleagues in WHO, together with Valentina and others, we are doing everything possible to try to find ways to help keep education going despite the threat. Joseph, back to you. 
Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Nabarro. Um, I just have to say, you know, we're very conscious of uh, the, the work that you're doing on this and, and certainly want to very formally acknowledge that, acknowledge the leadership of the World Health Organization and your personal commitment to children, to children's health uh, and to supporting the world as we confront this pandemic. It feels like a real privilege to be able to hear from you directly today uh, rather than on the radio uh, and, and, and to hear from Dr. Baltag as well. Um, colleagues, um, we've got about 15 minutes left or so and I have a question from um, uh, doc, uh, from uh, Ms. V uh, Desiree Vanderwelt, who is a member of the National Assembly uh, of South Africa. So, uh, Desiree, if you could come in. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is now almost 1400 hours here in South Africa, Cape Town. And um, this has been very informative, and surely I could share this with our portfolio committee in the National Assembly. I um, did post something on the chat group to inform you that um, although the, the COVID in some of our provinces are not stable at the moment and was declared a hotspot in one of our provinces, we do have 1.1 million learners writing their final exams. In South Africa, you know, we write our exams in November, December, where unlike in Europe, you have your new year from August onwards. So at the moment, provision was made, and I'm sure um, as far as possible, it's been monitored. But since the exams have started for the matriculants, we have not had any incident of uh, positive COVID-19 at our school. So it seems like uh, the department is set up for it. But uh, of course, we have to keep on monitoring. So, um, yeah, I think uh, the important documentation and inputs today will also advise and assist on, on us going forward. So I would just like to thank Doctor for all the um, inputs. Thank you so much. Can I make a quick comment? Uh, I'm super impressed with the way in which the people uh, and authorities in different provinces of South Africa have been dealing with COVID are really, really marvelous. I had various exchanges. I just want to say three things. One, that I find that usually the transmission of the virus happens in people's homes or around the school rather than actually in the school, the school itself. Schools are doing remarkably and children are great. They, they work out what they've got to do. Number two, that I, I did want to, to say to you and to others that there will be occasional chains of transmission, even clusters develop in schools. Uh, I, I don't think that means you shut the school immediately. I think there are ways of keeping schools open, despite the fact that you've got a cluster, you may have to uh, isolate a particular part or let a particular group of kids go out, but it shouldn't be necessary always to close the whole school just because there's one or two. And number three, I'd love to find a way in which we can really give praise and credit to all the school teachers, particularly the head teachers, who are doing such an amazing job. In the countries that I'm closely encountering, often it's the head teacher that has to just take the extra responsibility, and they do find this quite stressful. And so uh, I'm sure in, in, in South Africa, you must have almost a list of the brilliant head teachers, perhaps it's all of them, who are doing such a great job. Wouldn't it be great if as this all advances, we can find a way to really give credit to them. They are fabulous people anyway, but what they're doing on COVID is brilliant. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much again, David. And, and great to hear uh, that about South Africa from, from, from you. And, and thank you very much uh, to Desiree for joining from, from, uh, from Cape Town. Uh, colleagues, is there any other interventions? I'm conscious that our colleague from uh, from from Senegal um, uh, joined, and we haven't provided a French translation on this occasion. And um, that was a bit of an oversight, but we did ask colleagues. But um, David, I know that you can speak French, so I don't know if our colleague from Senegal wants to ask your question in French. Oui, je voudrais vraiment parler avec Dakar. Si vous avez, si vous pouvez parler avec moi en français, Baboka, je peux essayer. Mais aussi on a Valentina. Elle peut Très bien par le français. Et 
Uh, parfait. Um, if if if, if uh, Bubaka Bia wants to come in, please please do. Are there any other colleagues before we speak? Um, before we finish up, because uh, one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure that these uh, sessions lasted for just an hour. We know how busy colleagues are, so we're about to finish. But I think we've got time for one or two quick questions and a response from Dr. Nabara or from Dr. Baltag. Mike, do you want to come back in? Yes, please. Yeah, if I, if I could. Um, first off, I would say, uh, Dr. Navarro, watch for uh, a, a friend of mine, Nicola Toffelmeyer is working uh, at WHO right now. So please say hi for me. I keep trying to hire her away, but you guys keep promoting her. But sorry, sorry, <laughs> one of our best. There you go, there you go. Well, um, my question's regarding testing. So um, I've been of the mind for some time, but I'm not a medical expert at all. But every time I go out and I, I have a hot tub in the backyard and I have a thing of hot tub test strips that I just dip in and test and it's really quick and whatever you buy 50 at a time, you know, if there was, uh, and I, I know there's rapid testing technology, but where are we with dependable rapid tests that we can deploy on mass to particularly essential workers, but anybody that's in circulation um, out there on a regular basis. Uh, maybe give an update quickly if you could. About Dr. Nabara, before you um, do that, I'm just going to indicate uh, that another one of our uh, member parliamentarians from Austria uh, posed a question in the chat, which it might be that um, Valentina will, will want to come in on. It was essentially, what sort of measures do you advise taking in uh, uh, schools to increase health, uh, public health provision, etc. And so I'm going to turn to Dr. Baltag after you, Dr. Nabarro, um, but we really appreciate uh, our colleague, uh, Mrs. Salzman's question from Austria as well. So first to Dr. Nabarro and then for some closing comments too to Dr. Baltag. Joseph and Mike, can I just say um, the best thing in the world for dealing with COVID would be to have a reliable dipstick test like Mike uses for uh, his um, his tub, uh, which we could just have everybody in uh, having in their schools so that they could just put it in the saliva of each child and within uh, a few seconds know whether or not they have COVID. And uh, I have been encouraging uh, work on that development really since uh, February, March, when this started out. I think we're about three months away, Mike. It's uh, the, the technology is available. It's quite intricate uh, and the prototypes are being developed. These are not the same as what was used in the White House, what's called the rapid antigen tests. The ones that are coming and, and are being worked on are tests for the whole virus that pick up what's called the spike protein that give you a strip that's like what you've got in the tub uh, uh, that uh, then changes color. Yeah, it's about, it's, it's, it's about three months. And when we have that, I tell you, life in school is gonna be a lot easier. Uh, you'll be the first to know. Thank you. Thank you. Good to hear, thank you. David, before we um, before I ask uh, Valentina to come in, um, our colleague from the Federal Parliament of Nepal has made the point that there schools and universities have been closed for some uh, eight months, and I think the, imp the implication is that they have not reopened. I don't know if you know about the situation in Nepal, but but what would you, uh, how would you respond to that? Bimalaji namaskar, uh, that was my little bit of Nepali. Hello to Mr. Bimala. Uh, yeah, I am in contact with government of Nepal quite regularly. And uh, I am, like you, concerned that educational institutions have been shut for so long. Uh, I will follow up through my informal contacts to see what the plans are in the coming weeks and months. And I will uh, not be able to do that immediately, but I will ask Joseph to mm. give me uh, your contact details because I think it is helpful if we can together think of some long-term strategy. The situation in Nepal 
as in other countries in South Asia, continues to be very serious. And we need a pathway to offer to families uh, in that country, especially given the importance of education in the potential development of Nepal and her people. So I want to hold that, take it with me, and I will do my best to come back to you. Uh, Danya Bad. Thank you, Joseph. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. So we'll put you in direct contact and we appreciate uh, the participation of uh, our colleagues from Nepal and, and, and their advocacy for education in general and including in the pandemic, including uh, Bimala's uh, contribution. So thanks for that. And I should say, uh, David, you didn't hear at the outset that I'm chairing this because I'm standing in for uh, uh, Mrs. Aziz, a member of parliament from Pakistan, who was supposed to be chairing today, who in fact uh, has contracted COVID and has been ordered home and to bed, so couldn't join us, which of course is a stark reminder that this is a very real disease uh, and, it's, and it's impacting all of us, including members of parliament around the world. Colleagues, I'm conscious of the time. I'm going to call back David and then I'm going to uh, ask Valentina to share some uh, closing remarks. David. I just have to go. I have to say goodbye to everybody. You're late arriving and you're early leaving. It's how to really make a mess of things. But uh, the next one starts at 1300. But I do want to thank everybody and please stay in touch with me. Uh, and Joseph will tell you, but I will try to put in the chat my personal email and don't hesitate to write. You are absolutely vital people. Parliamentarians working on education are paving the way to the future. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Baltag, uh, some closing remarks from you, please. Thank you. Well, uh, my closing remark will be also linked to the question that Gertrude Sussman put uh, in the chat, uh, what countries are doing, uh, it was a question to everybody, uh, to increase uh, access to healthcare in schools and universities. And as it happens, We'll be launching very soon the first ever guideline of WHO on school health services. What we did, we reviewed the evidence. Uh, what does school health services, and this is school-based or school-linked health services, what contribution do they make to the health and well-being of students and teachers? And the conclusion is that when school health services are available, they have long-lasting benefits for students. So this is a good idea to implement well-resourced school health services. But I want to also reflect about what COVID-19 has taught us about schools and as an institution. Uh, and uh, my colleague, uh, David Nabarro, just mentioned that COVID is going to be with us sometime. But we also should be um, kind of, we are all very aware that situations like COVID, not necessarily related to a virus, uh, but might arise in future when schools will need to move between a blended, remote, in-person learning very fast. So it should become a new reality for the school. We also know that health in the 21st century is not acceptable, that health is an add-on to the literacy and numeracy. And what we want to promote is that health becomes the genetics of the education and what the school does. So the schools contribute to the literacy, numeracy, health and well-being in equal measure. I think we as society uh, cannot tolerate that students spend between 5,000 and 10,000 hours in school during their school life and they do not the basics of negotiating um, conflict resolution and other health related skills that might prevent now and in future many, many problems that we face today. So uh, we will be launching global standards for health promoting schools and the key message is making every school a health promoting school. It is not optional, it should become what schools is about. And I'm using this opportunity having MPs in this call to, to bring this, this change to your societies and to ask what is the role of education in your society? Should it be about broader issues, life skills issues, uh, cognitive capacity, conflict resolution, emotional skills, uh, healthy living skills, health literacy, as well as uh, uh, numeracy and literacy. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. I am looking forward for engaging if there will be follow-up questions. Thank you.
Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Beltag. That was a fantastic note to end on because it opens up a whole other conversation around uh, what schooling's for and, of course, the important role that schools play in, in promoting children's health. So I think there's a, a rich discussion to be had here, which I know I've seen a number of um, our members nodding would be of interest to them moving forward into the future as well. Um, some of the issues which you touched on are going to be uh, picked up in our future uh, briefings for MPs, which are occurring over the next three weeks, focused on learning, focused on equity and finally focused on the importance of financing uh, in a post-COVID world. Uh, so we look forward to our uh, colleagues joining us for those as well. And I should also add colleagues that we will produce a short briefing on this topic, which we will be sending to all our member parliamentarians and it will include all of the links that have been provided today with some additional information so that you have that at your fingertips. Um, and I think I'm going to also invite Dr. Baltag to write us a blog on health promoting schools uh, that we'll put up on the website and that can form the basis of uh, a catalyst for further discussion about that topic as well. So uh, finally, I just wanted to say thank you all for joining. We are five minutes over the time that we said that we would um, try and finish, but I hope you found it useful. Uh, I've certainly found it um, fascinating and really enjoyed the discussion that we've been able to have. Really grateful for all of your uh, participation because I know how busy you are. And uh, Mike's already been acknowledged a number of times for joining us at 4 a.m. where he is from. Um, uh, but I want to do it again because um, that uh, really does show a huge amount of effort. But I want to thank all of you for, for taking the time to join today. And of course, our speakers, uh, Dr. Baltag, Dr. Nabarro, uh, and Stefania Giannini from uh, UNESCO who joined us via video. There will be a recording of this if you want to share it with colleagues who aren't, weren't able to join. And we look forward to seeing some of you next week if you're able to join for our discussion on learning with the Global Director of Education from the World Bank, Jaime Saavedra. So thanks everyone, look forward to uh, being in touch and above all, uh, stay safe and well. Thank you.